Uh, hello everyone, I'm Jiv Gossai, cardiologist at Bradford Teaching Hospitals, and I'm talking about chronic heart failure, um, specifically talking a bit about the diagnosis of chronic heart failure, management, how we manage our chronic stable patients, and how we might deal with patients who are deteriorating and an acute flare of heart failure as well. So for disclosures, I have had speaker fees in the past from Medtronic, AstraZeneca, Novartis, Bayer, Travel and Hospitality, and I've organised edu educational events supported by a variety of companies. Um, so today, my intention was to talk about what is chronic heart failure? How do we diagnose it? How do we manage the newly diagnosed patient? And what do we do for patients with a new diagnosis of heart failure? What do we do for the chronic stable heart failure patient and how should we keep an eye on them and management manage them? And how do we manage the patient who's decompensating or a patient with an acute exacerbation of heart failure, either previously known or not previously known? So I think it's important first to talk about what is heart failure. And the critical point here is that heart failure is a clinical syndrome evidenced by the inability of the heart to meet the needs of the body. So it's a mismatch of input and output and output from the heart specifically. It always causes circulatory failure, but it's important to remember two things. Firstly, not all circulatory failure is cardiogenic. You can have other conditions where the circulation is inadequate. An example of that might be anemia or severe sepsis, where the circulation is inadequate to meet the needs of the rest of the body at the time of whatever illness is going on. It's also important to say that heart failure is a clinical syndrome, so it is entirely possible to have dysfunction of the heart without causing a clinical syndrome of heart failure. And the management of those patients is slightly different to how we would manage someone with a clinical syndrome of heart failure. But when you go looking for heart failure, the first step, or when a patient presents with symptoms, the first thing to remember is it is a clinical syndrome, and that should frame everything that we do. And therefore, everything we do should be thinking about, does this patient have signs or symptoms consistent with a diagnosis of heart failure? It's important to say that it's common. And if we look at the PHE fingertips data, then in our region, Bradford and Airedale, um, there is approximately a 1% quaff prevalence of patients with heart failure in Bradford and Airedale. That compares to an overall England average of 0.93, so slightly higher than the national average, but actually a little bit lower than the regional average in northeastern Yorkshire and Humber, which stands at just over 1.1%. So these are data from Fingertips, uh, Public Health England, which is a really useful resource if people want to go and have a look at the prevalence of diseases and how they're managed. It's a really comprehensive data set based on the primary care data set. And I'm sure many of you already will be accessing fingertips to look at various disease profiles and obviously the cardiovascular disease profile is the one that we're um, that I've pulled these data from. <clears throat> so is heart failure one thing or is it a number of things? As I said, it is a clinical syndrome and we call it a clinical syndrome because predominantly um, there are shared features of heart failure common whatever the underlying etiology and whatever the underlying pathological adaptations that we see be that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction which is where we predominantly refer to the left ventricular ejection fraction a measure of how much blood is ejected by the left ventricle with every heartbeat being preserved. So greater than 50% is the usual number we use when we talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we also consider heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And a few years ago, the ESC introduced an additional concept into their diagnosis and guidelines of heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. So we now typically apply three cutoffs. So we apply an ejection fraction of greater than 50% when we talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, ejection fraction between 40 and 50% when we talk about mildly reduced, and below 40% when we talk about reduced ejection fraction. And it's important that we do subdivide it in that way because there are important implications both for how patients do and what their prognosis is, but also there's important implications in terms of what the treatment and what the evidence base for the treatment that we use. Um, it's also in, 
worth mentioning at this point, there's a fourth subgroup, and that's heart failure with recovered ejection fraction. So those are patients who have previously had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and then usually because of therapy or because there's been an acute illness, which has got better for another reason, <coughs> apologies, um, then their ejection fraction actually recovers. And again, we handle those patients in a slightly different way. It's really important as well to understand what the underlying cause is. There are a number of causes of heart failure, which we'll discuss in a moment. And it is really important when we make a diagnosis of heart failure, not just to stop when we've identified the clinical syndrome and stratified by ejection fraction, but to understand what actually has caused it, because there are some causes which may be reversible. There are some causes which might have implication for treatments, there are some causes which might have implications for the patient's prognosis, driving, work and other activities and also some of the causes of heart failure have significant implications for the wider family of the patient insofar as a number of causes have got a genetic link and it's important to be aware of them. So when we talk about the causes of heart failure we talk first about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the commonest causes that we see are heart failure secondary to coronary artery disease either patients who have had a known history of myocardial infarction, or perhaps patients who have got very severe coronary disease leading to a chronic ischemic syndrome. Hypertension is also an important cause. Diabetes, so diabetes, and there is evidence that diabetes in isolation can lead to a syndrome of heart failure, although more commonly we see diabetes and perhaps hypertension as being risk factors for the development of coronary artery disease. We talk about the group of conditions called the dilated cardiomyopathy, some of which can be genetic and some of which can be acquired, either secondary to toxins, medication, lifestyle factors. We talk also about valvular heart disease and any chronic arrhythmia, particularly those with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter with a chronically uncontrolled ventricular response where the heart is tachycardic for an extended period of time. We also talk about infections and inflammation, so the group of conditions like myocarditis or inflammatory myocarditis. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is a special subgroup of heart failure that can appear either within the last trimester of pregnancy or within the first few months peripartum. Congenital heart disease is also an important cause of heart failure and the syndrome that is induced is often one of heart failure, whatever the congenital lesion. We talk about drug induced and that is both medical drugs, so the chemotherapy agents being the most commonly recognised, but some of the other drugs which are in reasonably common clinical practice as well. And also some other drugs, uh, a good example being cocaine and excess alcohol can lead to a syndrome of heart failure. There are the idiopathic cardiomyopathies where we don't identify an underlying cause despite extensive investigation. And then there's the relatively rare conditions as well, so endocrine abnormality, rheumatology disease and neuromuscular dis disease, particularly the muscular dystrophies. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is the second biggest group of patients that we see and treat. And again, many of the causes can overlap with those of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So coronary artery disease, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, valvular disease, and some of these are conditions which are uh, or heart failure preserved ejection fraction is often considered to be a condition of advancing age, so is more commonly seen in older patients. But there are some specific cardiomyopathies, particularly hypertrophic, restrictive and amyloid cardiomyopathy, as well as constrictive pericarditis, which can lead to a syndrome of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's also important to consider right heart failure, so a syndrome where the predominant lesion is that of the failure of the right heart rather than the left heart, although it's true to say that the commonest reason for right heart failure is actually failure of the left heart with secondary problems related to the right heart. Coronary artery disease and infarction of the right ventricle can cause right heart failure. It's relatively uncommon but possible. Pulmonary hypertension either as a primary lesion, which is very uncommon but possible, or as a secondary lesion, secondary to something like a pulmonary embolus or connective tissue disease, 
pulmonary valve stenosis and other congenital abnormalities of the right heart, pulmonary embolism we've talked about as being a cause of pulmonary hypertension, chronic lung diseases, and again, neuromuscular diseases or anything where the work of breathing is impaired, leading to chronic pressure on the right heart can lead to a syndrome of right heart failure. So starting with diagnosis, and as I said at the top of the talk, heart failure is always a clinical syndrome. So the first thing to start with is the symptoms. The most common symptom which we're presented with is one of breathlessness, and we can grade that on the MRC scale of breathlessness grade one to five, and that's common for breathlessness of any cause, not just cardiogenic breathlessness. So we talk about exertional dyspnea, so people who are absolutely fine at rest and perhaps on normal levels of exertion, but if they try and exert themselves above what is usual for them, and we quite often see that unmasked, for example, where people have been relatively limited and then try and do a bit more, they become breathless. One example of that might be someone with severe arthritis that has a hip or a knee replacement and expects them to be able to do everything that they used to be able to and suddenly finds that they're not. Orthopnea, so that's breathlessness on lying flat. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, so that is relatively abrupt onset breathlessness that happens at night, dyspnea at rest, and then acute pulmonary edema being the most severe end of the breathlessness scale. We also talk about fatigue, which is a very common, but unfortunately very vague symptom in heart failure. Lots of patients will present to us as feeling fatigued. Um, and it is very difficult if that's the only symptom the patient presents with to attribute that to heart failure. But if they have other symptoms alongside it, then it is a diagnosis you may wish to explore further. Abdominal discomfort, particularly in younger patients in whom they can't develop lower limb edema and lower limb edema being another fairly typical symptom of heart failure. But there are obviously other causes that can lead to lower limb edema and cough. So when making a diagnosis, it's important to start with some relatively basic investigations. So an ECG should always be done in these patients. And typically, as a first line investigation specifically, we will go for an NT Pro BNP. So this is a simple blood test measured alongside the patient's user knees. And we know that it will rise in patients with heart failure. It can be used both to help us with the diagnosis of heart failure, but also to help us in terms of management of the disease as a chronic entity and assessing response to therapy and how people are doing as their symptoms and as their disease progresses. At the diagnostic stage, we typically apply two cutoffs. So NT Pro BNP, we measure and we apply that if it is less than 400, then a clinical syndrome of heart failure is very unlikely with a high predictive value. If it's between 400 and 2000, then there may be evidence and you should look for other evidence um, to help make or exclude a diagnosis of heart failure. And if it's over 2000, then a diagnosis of heart failure is more likely. And again, you should do investigations to confirm that diagnosis. It's important to note a few things with NT Pro BNP. It should be interpreted in the context of the rest of the patient. So their age, their comorbidity, we know it will increase with age. There are a number of things which modify NT Pro BNP, which I'll go on to speak to in a moment. It is important to interpret alongside renal function and also a full blood count to look for evidence of anemia. But ultimately, if the NT Pro BNP is elevated, then the next test which you will do will be an echocardiogram to tell us if there is any evidence of any structural abnormality associated either with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I've mentioned some of the things on this slide which can cause an elevation of NT Pro BNP, and some of them are direct causes of heart failure as a clinical syndrome, and some of them are unrelated. So clearly it is elevated in heart failure and often will until treatment is established. It's elevated in asymptomatic left ventricular hypertrophy, secondary to hypertension or other causes. It is elevated in arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, and we commonly see elevated levels of NT-proBNP in atrial fibrillation. It can be elevated in pericardial disease, 
acute and chronic pulmonary embolus, pulmonary hypertension, sleep apnea, acute infection and sepsis, as well as stroke. It's important to say that renal impairment will lead to a chronic elevation of NT pro BNP, and that can make interpretation a bit more difficult, particularly in this patient population who often have coexistent chronic renal impairment and hypertension. Anemia, cirrhosis, burns, and rarely in snake bites as well. There is a form of snake bite which actually injects an NT pro BNP like compound into the body, which is misinterpreted on the assay. It's also important to say, as before, that it does rise with age, and therefore in some countries and in some guidelines, you may see age-specific cutoffs being used rather than the blanket 402,000, which we apply under NICE guidance. Females tend to have higher NT pro BMPs than males. And it's also important to note that in obesity, then the levels of NT pro BMP which are measured are often reduced. And for patients on the borderline, there's evidence that suggests that 20% of those who, if their NT pro BMP was measured and they were an ideal body weight, would have been missed off when they're obese because the levels are slightly lower. So that is an important note of caution. If you have someone who you strongly suspect a syndrome of heart failure, but they are obese and their NT pro BMP level is lower than you might otherwise expect to maintain that level of suspicion. In practice, though, we do see that the majority of patients, even when they are quite significantly obese, will have an elevated NT pro BNP above the thresholds which we use to start investigation, and we make a diagnosis via conventional channels, usually with an echo. Once you have made a diagnosis, usually, as I said, with an NT pro BNP and other baseline blood tests, an ECG, followed by an echocardiogram, then the next step is to think about what to do. Um, so that might lead you to a diagnosis of the clinical syndrome. And the next steps are to start some treatment to start to improve the patient's symptoms and hopefully to improve their prognosis, induce at least some re remission or reprieve from the symptoms they're experiencing, and then maintain that and hopefully improve how they feel and also their prognosis. And then, as I've mentioned above, to start to look for the etiology of their heart failure. We know that diuretics are very useful to help treat the symptoms, particularly breathlessness and low limb edema that are associated with heart failure. There isn't any strong evidence of a prognostic benefit from diuretic therapy, but there is strong evidence that it helps people feel better and hopefully do a bit more. And then that allows you to start treatment with other drugs and devices and interventions which might help to improve the patient's prognosis. And we'll go on to talk a bit more about the drugs, devices and interventions that we can use in heart failure. But it is important to say that when you've got a highly symptomatic patient, the first thing usually to do is start with therapy with diuretics. We apply a staging system in heart failure, which many of you will be familiar with. And the one which is most commonly used is the MYHA classification, which subdivides heart failure into four stages of classification. It's really important to say this isn't a stage in the conventional sense that patients can and frequently do start at a low or a moderate class and can get better, can get worse or can say the same. It's not inevitable that patients will start at stage one and then progress through the stages. Although in the vast majority of patients, heart failure is a chronic and progressive illness. So we do see that the majority of patients will over the longer term progress. Um, but patients can often be quite sick at the time of diagnosis and perhaps in my MYHA class three or four have quite marked improvement as they improve and as they get treated and perhaps go back to MYHA class one or two for a period of time followed by decompensations. It's also important to say that the MYHA classification is quite subjective and really talks about breathlessness as being the cardinal symptom which we assess, MYHA class one being no limitation at ordinary activity and obviously ordinary levels of activity will vary widely from patient to patient all the way down to MYHA class four, which is symptomatic at rest and highly symptomatic without doing anything 
i.e. usually able to lie in bed and frequently in these patients hospitalised or housebound. So again, it's important to look for the etiology once you've made a diagnosis. And a key factor, really key factor, is the history in looking for a diagnosis. So do they have any history of chest pain or coronary risk factors that would prompt you to look for coronary artery disease, which overall is the commonest cause of heart failure that we see? Do they have any other medical comorbidities or drug use that might be a clue to the etiology? particularly things like recent treatment for cancer, hypertension, diabetes, chronic renal impairment, connective tissue disorders. It's also really important to take a detailed family history. And that goes beyond just asking patients, have you got any family history of heart trouble? But explore, particularly patients' first degree relatives, ask if the patient's parents and any siblings and children are still alive, if they have any diagnoses, and also if they know of anyone within the family that's had a sudden or unexplained death or had a death attributed to something like a heart attack or heart failure at a young age without obvious explanation. Based on the findings by history, you then may want to go on and think about further investigation. So to look for evidence of coronary disease, you may wish to think about doing a CT scan or some form of perfusion imaging to look at the vascular supply to the heart. You may wish to think about an MRI scan. So an MRI is a more detailed scan that allows us a more detailed look at the myocardium itself. And in cases where echo imaging is limited, may give us additional information. But it is important to say that MRI isn't simply a better echo. It gives us a different data set to what echo does. And therefore, there are examples and times when echo is a more appropriate and superior imaging technique. There are times when MRI gives us more information and more detailed diagnostic information. The majority of patients now, although not all, with implanted cardiac devices, pacemakers and defibrillators will have MRI conditional systems and most of them will be able to undergo an MRI. But it is important to say that the actual metal hardware inside the heart can mean that the image quality that you get around where that metal work is, is reduced. And there are still some patients who won't have MRI conditional pacing or defibrillation systems and won't be able to undergo an MRI. They may also have extra cardiac metal work, which means that they can't undergo an MRI scan. And many patients are claustrophobic and struggle. It is generally something like 30 to 45 minutes in the scanner in a relatively enclosed space, and some patients aren't able to tolerate that. Particularly if you think right heart failure may be part of the syndrome that you're seeing, then some sort of thoracic imaging and perhaps lung function testing can be important. And when cardiac rhythm is implicated as a possible etiology or driver of their heart failure or stressing factor on their heart failure, then cardiac rhythm monitoring for a longer period of time than a simple 12 lead ECG may also be indicated. And in some cases, particularly if there is a clear family link or if a diagnosis is made, which is considered very likely to be familial, then genetic screening and genetic testing may well be an option for patients as well. And then we have the treatment for heart failure. So starting out with treatment, then diuretics do remain a cornerstone. There isn't a set starting dose, and that has to be made really based on your judgment when you see the patient. Furuzamide and vimetanide are the most commonly started drugs. And for diuretic, naive patients, you may wish to consider something along the lines of furuzamide 40 milligrams twice a day. And the equivalent to that is bumetanide 1 milligram twice a day. Bumetanide is a slightly sm smaller molecule and therefore may show some slightly better absorption in patients, particularly those who have got excessive fluid overload and therefore may work slightly more effectively. And clearly it's important to monitor patients' electrolytes and renal function when you initiate diuretics. In many cases, you'll often see an improvement in kidney function as you get people's circulating volume back closer to their ideal, but it can be the case that you will see significant electrolyte or renal abnormalities. If there is atrial fibrillation or another arrhythmia of a fast ventricular response, it's important to think about slowing it down. And the first line would usually be a beta blocker, 
although digoxin and in some limited cases amiodrone might be considered. The patient may have very rapidly worsening symptoms or be very severely unwell or acute comorbidity or a failure to respond to outpatient ambulatory measures and in those cases you may need to consider hospitalisation for these patients hopefully to get things looking better and to a point where they can be discharged for ambulatory therapy and continued management and fortunately very rarely but cardiogenic shock is the extreme end of the acute heart failure scale and despite advances in therapy the prognosis for cardiogenic shock particularly outside of the setting of an acute myocardial infarction does unfortunately remain very poor these are patients who are managed in hospital and the outlook and the prognosis remains uncertain for that group of patients in a large number of cases when we talk about treatment we often and many people will be familiar with the four pillars approach to the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so this is certainly those with an ejection fraction of less than 40 percent and many of these will be considered for an ejection fraction of between 40 and 50 percent so the cornerstones of that treatment remain ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients who are unable to tolerate an ACE inhibitor and if a patient is already on treatment with an ACE inhibitor or ARB for example if they've got a history of hypertension then you don't necessarily want to switch it but try and up titrate it and in patients with severe LV systolic impairment who remain symptomatic you may wish to switch to secupital valsartan which is the only drug in the ARNI class. Beta blockers remain very important for anyone who's able to tolerate them. The MRA groups, spironolactone and eplerinone, and possibly in the fullness of time, phenerinone, which is currently licensed in the management of CKD, but has got some more recent evidence in heart failure. And the SGLT2 inhibitor class is the most recent addition to the drugs that we have been using for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are associated with significant improvements, both in symptoms and prognosis. On top of the four pillars, it's not uncommon for patients to maintain the need to have at least some loop diuretics added to their treatment in perpetuity. The diuretic doses can be adjusted up and down and ideally as low as possible, depending on the patient need. But there are a group of patients who never quite manage to get off their loop diuretics despite optimised doses of the remainder of their drugs. If Aberdeen is a sinus node inhibitor that is does occupy a useful space in helping to get patients in sinus rhythm to help slow them down when despite either full dose of beta blockers or an inability to tolerate higher doses of beta blockers remain relatively tachycardic because it's a sinus node inhibitor it only works in patients in sinus rhythm and has no role in atrial fibrillation very rarely we may consider the combination of hydralazine and isosorbide mononitrate or isosorbide dinitrate. That's a relatively old combination of drugs that showed some evidence before the modern era, certainly of ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitor therapy, but can sometimes be a useful adjunct in patients who really can't tolerate much by way of ACE inhibitor or MRA, or indeed who remain very hypertensive despite maximized doses of all of the other classes of drugs. And digoxin, we've talked about as an adjunct in rate control. I've put it in here to discuss that some people still consider digoxin for its use primarily in heart failure, even in sinus rhythm, as a very weakly positive inotropic agent. And it can be tried, but there's very limited data that tell us that it has much of a difference or makes much of a difference in terms of prognosis. It's also important alongside starting the conventional therapy for heart failure to try and treat any specific etiology. If there is evidence of coronary disease, then optimization of medical therapy. And if there is significant coronary disease in ordinarily patients will be treated with a statin and in many cases aspirin or other antiplatelet therapy as well. It may push us towards device therapy and we'll talk about device therapy in more detail in a moment. If there are symptoms of angina, you may wish to consider revascularization to try and help with the symptoms of angina, but several big research trials have shown us that revascularization 
when there is heart failure and significant coronary disease is not associated with an improvement in prognosis when there is no symptoms of angina and does not help us improve prognosis purely from a heart failure point of view. If there's hypertension, then clearly it's important that hypertension is aggressively and well controlled. Removal of any stressing agents, that may be if patients, for example, have a history of excess alcohol or cocaine use, then they would be very strongly advised to abstain completely. Even if they drink what might be considered otherwise relatively modest amounts of alcohol, then there is good evidence that a new diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, we really should encourage them total abstinence for a period of at least six months after diagnosis is made. And then following that, they likely or may well have a, an increased susceptibility to alcohol and they should treat it with real caution after that. Any other stressing agents may be a bit more difficult to rationalise, but may need doing, particularly if it's something like chemotherapy for malignancy. It's also important to try where possible to control arrhythmia, and that may entail rate control for atrial fibrillation or possibly rhythm control to try and restore sinus rhythm. And if there is significant valvular heart disease, then of course we may need to think about interventions to the valve and working the patient up towards an intervention to repair or replace the valve. <clears throat> We'll go on to talk about the treatment for HEFPEF. And generally speaking, HEFPEF are a slightly different group of patients. These tend to be patients who are older and more comorbid. Of all the drugs that have been tried for HEFPEF, there are no drugs which are proven to prolong life. However, there are drugs which have demonstrated some improvement in the symptom management of HEFPEF, and we'll go on to talk about those. It is important to try and treat the underlying cause or causes, and that's particularly true when there's hypertension or poorly controlled diabetes. Because they are an older and more comorbid group of patients, it's really important to manage that comorbidity and try and improve their comorbidity as much as possible. Diet, exercise and weight management play a really important role actually in the treatment of both HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, but I've mentioned it here because often they do lead to significant symptomatic improvements in these patients and improved functional status. If the patient has got significant lower limb edema, then that can be treated symptomatically with diuretics. But it is important to be cautious and judicious with diuretic use, that the use of loop diuretics, particularly with their fairly aggressive diuretic effect, can lead to a worsening of falls or incontinence for patients. And if patients have got reduced mortality already, then you may find that the use of a loop diuretic or high doses of loop diuretic, because they're then rushing to the toilet, causes an increase in their falls and the consequent risk of injuries. The SGLT2 inhibitor class of drugs we've talked about for HEF-REF. In HEF-PEF, they have no life prolonging evidence of benefit, but they do have some evidence to reduce the risk of worsening heart failure events or hospitalisation with an NNT of around 32, so can be recommended to reduce the risk of hospitalisation for heart failure. Phenerolone is another drug which, as I mentioned, has now been used and is in use in the CKD group of patients and has, again, got some very recent data suggesting that it may be helpful in reduction of worsening hospitalizations, but again, has no prognostic data. And there is quite a lot of experimental work going on in HEFPEF to tell us a bit, try and tell us a bit more about what therapies might be effective and heart rate modulation with pacing is something which is in active research, but hasn't yet got any proven clinical benefits. I think it's important when we talk about heart failure to talk about the critical axis that exists between the heart and the kidneys. So when the body is at rest, then the kidneys take about a quarter of all the cardiac output, and therefore any disruption in cardiac output and volume status are really important, both in heart function and also in terms of kidney function. And the kidneys play a key role in managing our blood pressure. And if the kidneys sense that the heart may be failing, then they will try and increase the blood pressure through vasoconstriction. They also obviously handle fluid volume status, and they've got a key role 
in managing whether patients are fluid overloaded or fluid deplete or uvolemic. And some of the hormone signals they send have got important roles in cardiac contractility. Most of the key heart failure drugs that we use will have some impact on renal function and commonly, particularly for the ACE inhibitor, MRA and SGLT2 inhibitor group, as well as diuretics, what we'll see is a short term dip or a short term increase in urea and creatinine when we commence the drugs. But actually, if you look at the longer term data, so everyone's renal function beyond the age of 40 will gradually worsen. But if you look at the data for patients with HEFREF and HEFPEF, those that are treated with ACE inhibitors particularly will show a slowing of that worsening compared to patients not treated. So although in the first instance they will cause a short-term dip in kidney function, I would encourage you, as long as that's not too severe, to persevere with therapy and often then you'll see some improvement and in the longer term hopefully the kidneys will worsen at a slower rate compared to what they would have previously done. I'll go on now to talk about device therapy in heart failure. And there are three modes of device therapy that we can talk about. The first being pacing, primarily a treatment for bradycardia, cardiac resynchronization, which is a treatment for heart failure, and the implantable cardioverted defibrillator, which is primarily a treatment to reduce the risk of death from arrhythmia. So bradycardia pacing is primarily a device for the connect correction of bradyarrhythmias or perhaps control of tachycardia where conventional measures, drugs to control tachycardia, cause bradycardia. They are relatively straightforward and simple devices with a 1 to 2% risk of major complication at the time of implant or through the lifetime of the device. Battery operated devices that usually in most cases offer somewhere between six and 10 years worth of battery and can be implanted on both the left or the right hand side, depending on patient preference. And there are a relatively small group of patients who can have a leadless pacemaker, which is contained entirely within the heart. The big downside to bradycardia pacing in most cases is it does run the risk of induction of dyssynchrony and therefore worsening of left ventricular contraction. Although there are moves to implant more pacemakers which stimulate the heart's conduction system directly, which may have a lower risk of precipitating that. When we talk about heart failure, however, we're more often talking about cardiac resynchronization therapy. Cardiac resynchronization is a form of pacing therapy, which is to try and reverse electrical dyssynchrony. So in left bundle branch block particularly, Electrical activation within the left ventricle is delayed and therefore the left ventricle doesn't contract as effectively as it would ordinarily do if they didn't have the left bundle branch block. And cardiac resynchronization is an attempt to pace simultaneously on both the septal and the lateral wall of the left ventricle and correct this dyssynchrony and therefore improve pumping function of the left ventricle. And in around two thirds of patients implanted, if the right patients are chosen, we will see an improvement in cardiac function with cardiac resynchronization. In around the third, we will see no improvement, but hopefully we will see a slower weight rate of worsening than we ordinarily would have done. And the key indications for cardiac resynchronization are left bundle branch block, which has by far the strongest evidence for CRT. And we know the longer the patient's QRS, the more likely they are to get benefit, particularly when they have severe left ventricular systolic impairment. And we know that patients with a non-ischemic etiology for their heart failure and women do better than men compared to patients with an ischemic etiology or men. <coughs> it's important to say that cardiac resynchronization can be combined with an implantable defibrillator. They are more complex devices than bradycardia pacing and therefore associated with a slightly higher rate of complications. And there are some patients in whom we can consider implant for an atypical indication, um, although we do know that the prospect of response in those patients is lower. But talking about the implantable cardioverted defibrillator, so these are devices 
which have got the capability to detect potentially life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia. So that's ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia, and then offer therapy. There are two types of implant. There's transvenous, which look a bit like a pacemaker and have the functions of a pacemaker, or there are subcutaneous ICD devices, which are under the skin, but don't have any hardware within the heart. And the only purpose of an ICD is to reduce the risk of sudden death because of an arrhythmia. Although the transvenous ICD can also be coupled with bradycardia, pacing therapy and cardiac resynchronization where appropriate. They have two modes of therapy, so they can deliver anti-tachycardia pacing only through transvenous devices to try and pace a patient out of an arrhythmia. And if that fails, or for subcutaneous devices, they can offer a shock, so a powerful electric shock to try and terminate the arrhythmia and restore sinus rhythm or whatever the patient's rhythm was before. Again, compared to pacemakers and CRT alone, they have a slightly higher complication rate of around 4% of the implant. They should almost always be implanted on the left side only. There are more stringent driving restrictions with an ICD, particularly for those who drive on a Group 2 licence, i.e. a bus or a lorry. And they do need a conversation with the patient up front about the intended goal of therapy and the length of therapy. What I mean by that is it is really important when we're thinking about an ICD for a patient to talk to them about the fact that at some point in the future, we may need to consider deactivation of the defibrillator when it becomes clear that their health has deteriorated and that ongoing shock therapy is unlikely to be beneficial for them. ICDs are more likely to provide benefit in those with an ischemic etiology compared to non-ischemic and risk stratification and choosing the right patients for these devices does remain a challenge and is an area of continuous study. That's particularly too true for when we talk about the primary prevention, i.e. those patients who've never had a cardiac arrest. It's a bit more straightforward if a patient has had a cardiac arrest in the past and the vast majority of those should be offered an ICD unless there's another contraindication. But the primary prevention group, i.e. those that have never had a cardiac arrest, are a bit more challenging to risk stratify who should be considered for implant. Go on to talk a bit more about the deterioration of heart failure and how to manage it. And it's important these patients have a careful assessment to try and identify why they've deteriorated and how to improve matters. So it could be that they have a concurrent acute illness, often an infection of some description, perhaps a new arrhythmia. We know that lots of patients in heart failure who are in sinus rhythm that then develop atrial fibrillation, often decompensate rapidly when they do so. Hypertension and hypertensive crises are important, worsening renal function. Medication compliance is also really important. We're often asking our patients to stay on in excess of four or five different drugs long term, and medication compliance therefore is a significant issue in many cases. It may be that if they've had an ischemic or an inflammatory etiology to start with, that they are having recurrent events, which have caused deterioration. It may be simple fluid overload or the development of another abnormality, such as a left bundle branch block. And as I said at the top of the slides, heart failure in the majority of cases would be considered a chronic and progressive illness, and therefore most patients over time would eventually be expected to progress in their heart failure symptoms. So after a careful history and examination, you may wish to consider diuretic therapy to get on top of the acute deterioration. If severe enough, they may need hospitalization, either if they have rapidly advancing symptoms, symptoms which can't be managed outside of hospital, or there aren't structures in place to be able to manage them outside of hospital. You may wish to enlist the, care, the help of heart failure specialist nurses to help get them stabilised again and re-optimise therapy, particularly for patients who've had heart failure for a long time and newer therapies have been introduced, which the patients weren't on. And then it's really important when patients are deteriorating to think about making decisions on step up and symptom management and whether there are additional therapies open to that patient or not. And if the answer is not, then to think about what the next steps might be.
When there's a suspected deterioration, it's important to say that MT Pro BNP can be a really helpful adjunct to help identify that, particularly if the patients have lots of other comorbidities, for example, COPD, and there are other reasons why they may have worsening breathlessness, then MT Pro BNP can be very helpful to help us identify those in whom they are genuine worsening of heart failure or where something else may be leading to their symptoms. In a relatively small number of patients with advancing heart failure, we will consider them for advanced heart failure therapy, and that means referral to one of the centres who are able to offer transplant or left ventricular assist device. It's really important to say that these are limited resources and they are incredibly intensive for the patient and the family. And for patients who are accepted for transplant and LVAD, there's no guarantee that they will actually get the therapy. And for the vast majority who do get them, it will mean very extended hospitalizations of several months or so, and lots of return visits on a weekly basis to the transplant centre for assessment and rehospitalizations. And it really is a very significant treatment for a patient to go through. In those in whom we are thinking about it, then we'll consider workup. We may do a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which is a special exercise test that tells us a bit more about cardiac function. We might recheck their NT Pro BNP. We may get some statistical evidence on their survival using a heart failure survival score. And the one most commonly used and applicable to the UK population is the MAGIC risk score. That's MAGIC with two Gs. We might consider additional tests such as right heart catheterization and further imaging as well to determine whether someone might be suitable. I've not listed all of the indications and contraindications, but some of the common ones which is important to consider. The guidelines talk about aged over 75, but in practice, the data in the older patients who are who receive transplants or LVADs are very poor. And for the majority, it'd be unusual for a patient to be considered aged over 65 for transplant or LVAD. BMI of greater than 35, poorly controlled diabetes with an HbA1c persistently over 58, significant impaired renal function, which is irreversible, any history of cerebrovascular or peripheral vascular disease, frailty, continued smoking or substance misuse will usually be an absolute contraindication, poor social support because of the intensity of the therapy and the intensity of which the patient has to return for visits and the amount of support that they will inevitably require and evidence of poor compliance in the past. And for those with advancing heart failure in whom it's not thought appropriate to consider advanced heart failure therapies, transplantation or LVAD, then often we think about palliative care and generally speaking we tend to think of that too late for most patients and probably should start to think about it more earlier on in patient's journey, at least to introduce the concept. So this is primarily for patients with advancing heart failure with no additional prognostic therapies or modifiers, and it is often deployed too late once patients have had several hospitalization. You'll all be familiar with the goals of palliative care and they apply equally to heart failure as with any other illness. One of the challenges in heart failure is the fluctuant nature of the illness and the fact that patients can look quite severely weakened and their prognosis can appear very poor and they can often then make some recovery. But it is important to refer anyone who we think is approaching the end of their life for a holistic assessment of their needs and care. We do try where possible to continue their existing therapy, particularly their ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, MRAs, which do help with both the symptoms and prognosis. And it's also important to have discussions around resuscitation attempts with the patient, a more wider respect discussion around what they might want to have and changes perhaps in their living situation as their capability to climb stairs or get out and about changes. And as part of that discussion, then if they do have an ICD implanted, it's important to start to bring up the topic of when it's appropriate to deactivate therapies, because what we don't want is patients with an ICD in situ who it's clear that they're dying and having several shocks in the last moments of their life, which are painful and distressing and ultimately don't change the outcome. 